Ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, dear guests, dear colleagues, thank you very much for the opportunity to present the Swiss Port view on um, project and financing risk exposed to this audience. It's after the lunchtime, so I'll try to keep it concise. <laughs> Allow me for a second to introduce Swissport, which is the world market leader in airport services at this stage. Um, we currently serve over 300 airports on the planet in 50 countries, six continents, with a workforce of roughly 66,000 staff. And uh, that makes us the the largest airport services organization on the planet with a full range of products. And therefore, we have a unique position where we can have our experiences from six continents, from all the different cultural, economic, um, and geographical regions, which allows us to cross over all our experiences. And in order to manage that, and the bandwidth of different airports in the different locations, we have developed a very particular toolbox, which we call the, uh, the Swissport way, how to manage these situations, which is an integrated toolbox of management standards, systems, strategies, and tools that are at the disposal. So whatever there is Swissport on the outside, we want to make sure that there's Swissport on the inside through this Swissport formula, which is one of the key points that makes Swissport whatever Swissport is right now. Also, we have a strong drive in corporate sustainability since 2007, and we have launched a, um, a strong project uh, to have 50% of our total worldwide motorized fleet electrified by the year 2025. Now, for the Middle East, we currently serve five airports in two countries, looking to expand this footprint uh, later this year, and quite significantly, with a number of new airports coming online. Just to give you an idea, it is basically the three main airports in Saudi Arabia, then the main airport in Oman plus Mukhaisna, which is a PDO airport in the, in the middle of the country. How do we tackle investments? Um, how do we tackle risk? And uh, what do we do when we are looking at investment opportunities, be that at existing or at new opportunities? So in general, we have a variety of opportunities that we're looking at. One is obviously uh, growing out of an organic situation at an existing base, for example, by adding um, new product lines or enhancing the business. The second area is a selective acquisition opportunity, which we have done every so often. And um, the third one is large outsourcing to uh, customer airlines be that in the cargo area or in the, in the airline side. And the fourth one is then greenfield operations. The Middle East, as far as Swissport is concerned, was a greenfield operation. We started from zero and developed this business as a 100% direct foreign investment operation. Obviously then, going into a new area and a new greenfield required a lot of um, pre-planning and these, the strength and the, the tools that I've alluded to uh, in, uh, earlier in my presentation uh, gives us a baseline of how to attack that. So um, there is a, like a catalog of measures, points to look at, uh, questions to answer, including various forms of economic, political, and env environmental analysis, the regulatory framework, um, customer base, revenue as well as cost side, and then the, obviously the trends of the region in macroeconomic factors and in air transport factors going into the future. So all of these will, will basically build an overall picture of the individual country, and that comes through various sources, and they will be cross-referenced amongst each other in order to present that. As far as Saudi Arabia is concerned, Saudi Arabia itself um, has had double-digit uh, growth over the last so many years. It is forecasting also double-digit growth in the coming years. Uh, the initiatives that have been launched by the government and are quite comprehensive and with the latest drives in regard to tourism, the drives in, in Hajj and Umrah, the opening of the country, and the via relaxation of visa regulation, the tourism initiatives, all of that combined with the factor that 98% of passengers arrive by air 
gives us reason to believe that the double-digit growth factor will continue in the foreseeable future, notwithstanding the certain instabilities that the region now carries with it, which have been in one way or another uh, present for a number of years. And if not in one country, then maybe in another. Um, so the, the Middle East, in addition, and I don't need to, uh, you are all quite well aware of that, is, is the cornerstone between Europe, Asia, and Africa, and therefore geographically extremely well positioned as an international logistics hub. And if we look at the Saudi Vision 2030 in Oman, the, um, the, the Project 2040, then we see that the governments have very well realized that and trying to introduce that, and are encouraging and creating a climate that is obviously looking at uh, foreign investment, foreign companies to come to the region and to enhance the business, bring know-how, and develop the, uh, the, the uh, environment in the air transport and logistics sector in particular. Particularly Saudi Arabia has recognized that air transport is the key element and enabler of the Vision 2030 and of the strategies behind this. So coming from the business case, which is a structured process with standard formats, um, then a number of KPIs have to be met. It has to have find its way to reflect the overall group strategy and the overall group uh, targets for the time period. And it is a key factors in regard of cost base, financing options, and the revenue base have to be answered. Then there is a very structured process in the review, a peer review, a regional review, up to all through all the management levels. And in the end, there is a strong governance system in place, um, not only on the peer review, there is a, the, on the data review, but also in regard of decision support and uh, business development teams who will uh, validate support and help with any of these business cases so that we have a very structured way how to approach this. So in regard of the um, risks in particular, the main focus is that in a structured process to eliminate as many risks as can be, it can never be 100%, I think we can all agree on that. On the other side, it is also the case that if we can model as many risks as possible and prepare replies or uh, scenarios for them, that allows then, should a risk occur, for the management team to have the time um, to, to think about solutions, find solutions and implement them, because the majority of cases that can, or the, those that are foreseeable, have already been modeled and the answers are being prepared. And that all is part of the process and the gov particularly also on the governance side. Circling back to my initial slide where I showed the network of more than 300 airports, we can say that in all probability, if we encounter a problem that we haven't seen before in a particular country, chances are we will have encountered this somewhere in the network before. And if not, then it will be of most interest to the network of stations to find a solution. So the cross contribution between countries, regions, and stations is one of the enhancing factors. So we have a know-how base of all our staff worldwide, which is a huge factor that has helped us overcome various scenarios in various countries and regions. So on the investment itself, then there is a catalog of questions that had been asked uh, in internal investment, external investment, uh, a combination of factors, the conditions if it is a tender, and all of the um, combining factors in regard of shareholders, outside partners, go it alone. As far as the Middle East is concerned, um, we have done a 100% direct foreign investment at the start of the operation. In Oman, we have then um, combined it with a local partner who has become a shareholder. In the meantime, Saudi Arabia at this point is a fully 100% foreign direct investment. And um, that obviously has an advantage and disadvantages, but this was the decision that we made at the time we're quite happy with that. And um, notwithstanding any decisions by the government or tender condition that requires a local partner, then the variety in the 
ability to choose the way is one of the defining factors that has convinced us that the um, situation to invest in the country is an interesting case. The second case is also the availability of or a concern area, the availability of local qualified workforce, which was a key factor because one of the strong points that we want to bring to any country and any new operation is to upskill local workforce and develop them, particularly for newcomers into the organization from the bottom up, rather than sort of steal from competitors, we would rather hire and develop people from, from scratch and develop them into our methodology, into the Swissport way, into the Swissport formula, and then give them a career chance by running them uh, through our development programs. On the risk side, and this was the particular focus that we had for this session, obviously a question is always the, um, the legal structure of the country, the political stability, the repatriation of, of funds for um, profits and the, the shares between individual country and being that as a region. So from a logic standpoint, we start each country as a standalone organization and once it has reached a certain maturity, it will then be um, organizationally moved in combination with a region and then led by the regional structure. So that all the, um, the management team is on a regional level, not on a station by station level or country by country, actually. Obviously, then, all the financial regulations have to be observed. There is um, a significant amount of, of consultant companies who help with the setup on the legality side, on the financial side. All of that is available. And obviously, we have um, experienced teams in our head office in Zurich to support this uh, operation and the setup. For example, financial auditors are appointed on a worldwide scale so that um, these companies can then exchange um, all the information and tie it in from their standards as an auditor with the uh, data sources that Swissport provides on a worldwide level. And obviously, whatever we try to undertake or not undertake, but we want to measure the success, and this is the other cornerstone, is then we not just go in somewhere and then establish an operation, hope for the best, but we need to obviously plan based on the, all the analysis. And planning for us is one of the key factors. Again, as I've referred to before, and planning means we need to be able to measure these things because otherwise, how do we find out if the plan was accurate and can steer this? So on various levels, on the safety and quality side, on the operational and KPI side, as well as on the commercial and finance side and the cash flow and the revenue side, we have quite um, substantial in-house network on tools and systems available where we can capture data in real time and make the analysis available to the local management as well as to group management and review our position, where we stand, where we go, where are we relevant to budget, to our forecasts, and how do we reflect on the anticipated um, developments in the country in regard of market share, customer base, our performance, particularly the safety performance. Swissport prides itself on one of the best um, performances on the operational side available, and uh, this needs to be proven every single day, one over and again, every time. And this has basically led to the fact that we are one of the biggest operator, have become one of the biggest operators on the planet in the last 25 years with a very wide range of, of customers from, from uh, uh, international worldwide operators to regional operators and a whole range. With that, I would already like to conclude my presentation and I'm sub available for your questions after my esteemed colleague then has done his part. Thank you. So I'll be moving on to our next speaker, Mr. Mo Ashwami, Aviation Project Control Manager of ACOM. Has years of diverse experience in the aviation sector, leading complex program from inception to operation 
ORAT slash AOR for Greenfield Brownfield airports with capacity up to 50 million packs and cost exceeding $20 billion in mixed delivery models. He started his aviation career with Collins Aerospace Delivering Airport Operation and Security System, as well as Master Airport Systems Integration, MSI. Currently, he is working with ACOM leading the delivery of complex aviation programs around the globe. He's holding bachelor's degree in engineering, as well he is certified mentor in the American Association of Airport Executives and membership of the National Council for Public-Private Partnership. Mr. Mo Ashwami. Good afternoon. Hello? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me today. Uh, actually, my presentation today will be different than my colleagues because I will take you through the journey after the transaction is done for the PPP project till you start generating revenue from your airport project. Quick brief about ACOM. ACOM as an idea started with five company jointly shared a dream about creating a fir integrated firm delivering a better world where we are living now. And only in aviation, we've been able to, for 30 years now, we've been able to deliver more than 100 billion US dollar in airport projects and in-house, we have more than 1,000 aviation exp experts around 150 countries. ACOM realized the gap in infrastructure in aviation between uh, capacity, aging uh, facilities, uh, lack of technology. And we moved strategically and we create the GABL, which is a global aviation business line, which give you an integrated aviation service in simple term you imagine it and we deliver it. Okay, let me take you 50 years ago. When NASA was about to launch Apollo 1 in 1968, 67, sorry, they did, uh, before one month before the launching, they did a trial, a rehearsal for the launching. And everyone knows a sad accident in the cabinet, what happened to the cabinet and the crew. Since then, see, uh, uh, since then, NASA adopted uh, a mindset that it is unsafe to fly unless there is proof that nothing can go wrong. Since then, the operational trial was a vital process of all the aviation process. Two years later, two years later, NASA was able to land the mankind on the moon with safe only by adopting the operational trials during two years of trials. And to increase the success factor of operational, uh, we will go through uh, our uh, risk mitigation measure for today. We will go for detail in today. But talking about success, the, the record for success for delivering mega projects in uh, government mega projects, it doesn't, that looks like good. Oxford University telling us that one out of 10 projects is delivered on budget, and one out of 10 projects is delivered on time, and one out of 10 projects is delivered on benefits. This equation give us that one out of 1,000 projects in government delivered on time, on budget, and on benefit. And th there is many reasons behind this very bad records of government delivering projects is the aging delivery methodology they are using to deliver the projects. And we will go through a quick comparison between the traditional procurement for government and what is PPP is offering. So in simple term, in government project, you have the initial ca capital outlay during construction and during operation cost, uh, co operation cost during operation. 20 years of record telling us that 47% of the projects delivered by government is, is over budget. And 41% are overrun in OPEX itself. 
comparing with PPP, where the government agreed to pay uh, fees for a private firm over a number set of years, actually there is no capital outlay on the initial and no capex overrun. And during operation, users, user charges, availability of capacity charge, it is your measure of return. PPP is, doesn't have that kind of the perfect record as well because over the last 10 years, there is a debate about around 20% of the delivery, BBB project delivery, have a problem with the KBI and the performance. So in, you can compare between 20% KBI performance during operation, or you have overrun over OBEX and CAPEX from your project. This is in terms of budget itself. In terms of time, the normal delivery of projects which it is, we'll call it DBB, design, bid, built, and comparing with the PPP, the most effective function in the equation is when you have the construction, operation, and o and m inputs during design. This function in a, a study over 300 projects give us that you can save in construction time around from 10 to 20% of your time of delivering your construction phase of your project. Going specifically for aviation, San Francisco Airport was able to deliver $1.6 billion project, capital project, with no claims, with only forming of partnership. And it was at actually 20 to 25% lower the market rate on budget. And we have many examples, Sacramento and uh, uh, San Francisco as well, for example, in Sacramento, it was able to deliver the project 119 days earlier than the plan, only when the partnership between developer, operator, and stakeholder being formed from the beginning. And why we called PPB is a disruptive innovative. What the private sector bringing to the table? Private sector bring to the table a performance-based specification they bring to the table, the PPB bring to the table, an integration of design, construction, maintenance, and operation to the function. The private sector is more risk agile in mitigation, agile in more agile in risk mitigation when talking about risk. The private sector was, is able to provide a much financial free market. He can access the market much better than the government. Talking about success factor in PPP, one of the major success factor of PPP in airport and when you have the operator on board, 50% of the stress of airport project is coming out from the relation between the operator and the builder. So by having the operator in the fun on the equation of the PPP, you actually mitigate more, almost 50% of your stress or during the construction of your airport. Talking about risk and mitigation, when BPP been uh, in the market, uh, a model called NBV at risk being developed. This model give you the chance to define your risk exposure during the concession period and the relation between the construction period and the operational period. And in, 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 in simple term, you can see that your most risk is at construction and your most deficit is as construction period as well. So you need to apply a mitigation measure to make sure that as soon as possible you get out of your construction period. So this is your most risky and cash deficit you will have during your PPP journey. Coming to uh, what I called it soft landing. The chart in front of us, it is from the FAA. It gives us the relation between the pilot capability and the task requirement. And you, as we can see that during the most safe part, the most risky part, it is at the landing of the journey and the most safe at the start. So as much you start, you have a, a margin of safety. As much you going approach landing, you have the less margin of safety. So we need to apply some, uh, comparing this with projects, most of the project, around 30% of the project fail to go 
from construction to operation, which is the bottleneck at the end of any PPP project, any airport project. So what we are advocate here today is to add more risk mitigation toward the end of the project. So to get out of this bottleneck of failure during transition from construction to operation. And this is what we called ORAT. ORAT, it is stand for op uh, Operational Readiness Activation and Transfer. It is an integrated approach to manage the transition of new airport service or facility from project delivery into activation operation. So what ORAT team will do for you is as a risk proof and risk mitigation measure in airport, he will integrate your product, people, process, facility, and system together to get you the most return of your investment from day one. So ORAT recognized as a proven risk mitigation technique that increase opportunity for the seamless transition of new airport product, service, and facility from construction to active operation. Going to a little, little bit detail about what ORAD do. So you have the life cycle of your project from master planning, design, delivery, handover, operation, and maintenance. ORAD is a parallel path for your life cycle of the project. At the early stage, you will do operational planning from, from strategy and concept, and later will go for operational readiness from your product service and performance. And later stage, they will do activation to your people training process, uh, uh, robust facility performance system endurance. And later will do a basic intermediate disruption advanced trial to make that your process team and facility are ready to operate and migrate from construction to operation and will continue with you after opening during business continuity. We, we talk about risk, and uh, my colleague talk about uh, BPP as a risk transfer uh, tool, government transfer risk from government to private sector. But, and the equation is almost 60% uh, transfer to the uh, private sector, 18 to 20% maintained with the government and in between the shared risk. But the Harvard Business School telling us the most risky uh, risk you need to manage it is what we call the white space risk. So what, what is white space risk? Is the chance that not all activity required will be identified. And the second most critical risk you need to manage is the integration risk, is the chance that all the activity will not come together probably at the project completion. And here what our ORAT approach came. ORAT team will create the environment for success by, by connecting leadership and the structure for success by having an adapting uh, approach for ORAT to integrate connecting partnership with organization activity and transition, as well as stakeholder management. One of the study telling us that to deliver an airport project, you have more than three, 260 communication channel. So your team need to be more agile and more uh, wide experience to manage this um, amount of connections and communication channels. So what ORAT team do, he, they will connect, they will have one contact, single contact, single source of contact with multi-function uh, integration, which will take your stakeholder, construction stakeholder, airport stakeholder, and regulatory and government under one program, and will be able to update, revise, and plan, and act more agile than your own organization as a construction only as, or as an operator only. Coming to this, so you're, you, you, in BPB, you need to secure your time to market. So ORAT approach reduce your overall time to market. And we encourage that ORAT approach start from the early beginning of the project. Even we, we see some examples now in PPB, they are part of the arrangement in the the SPV uh, structure itself. So keeping project on track for soft landing, your airport will be much more 
ready to generate revenue when you're applying the ORAT approach. And this is my session. Thank you for having me. Yes. Thank you guys for the presentation. Uh, it was uh, pleasant. And thanks, Mohammed, because you've changed the color of the presentation. So we moved from the sleepy mood to an active mood. <laughs> uh, the question to Swissport. Now, looking as number one or leader in the market, of the ground handling surfaces uh, with a rigid robust system, governance system from, from A to Z, as you ex explained. How do you see it or how your company became agile or the agility in emerging market? Because when you wanna put there is, there is always a saying, there is uh, no one fits all. So you have a robust system and then emerging market, there is dynamic changes always. So agility, uh, ag agility is a bit of the key word. How do you cope up with that? If you could say, elaborate on it, thank you. Thank you for, for the question. That's in, 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 indeed a very interesting question. Now, one of the core things that, that, that Swissport prides itself on is, is to a certain level this exact rigidity, particularly as part as uh, the operational performance and especially safety is concerned. Those are the areas where we make a very clear stand that these are our standards and we were not willing to go down from them. And this is a cornerstone of our, of our thing and that helped us actually in driving our performance and the growth that the company has enjoyed over the past 25 years. Now, coming into the in individual markets, if we enter a new market, one of the cornerstones will be, can we implement our systems, our structures, or is there a contradiction between local regulation and what we do? And in case that Swissport is not able to introduce its own structures and standards, or will not be allowed to, then we may elect not to enter that market because we would not want to cannibalize on our own identity. Essentially, wherever it says Swissport on the outside, there should be Swissport on the inside. And we have that as a worldwide standard, particularly where safety and operational con uh, performance is concerned. On, on other ways, uh, other areas, for example, um, the ways where commercial contracts are, are done, there is then where there is room and flexibility to adapt to local requirements because in certain parts of the world, things are done a little different. But at that core, there is the rigidity, and we, we, we want to make sure that that rigidity stays. Thank you. Uh, my question goes to Gerard uh, from Swissport. Uh, just want to learn from your experience. Um, I have uh, got an ex uh, have seen in uh, in my country where you have uh, a service provider like Swissport um, operating, and because of the operation, they have to put up some investments. For example, I can give an example for one company which was given a, a commission to supply a fuel jet. So they had to put up some reservoir, reservoir according the whole, I mean, across the whole country. But then after three years, because of the change of the government, and they decided to put that service to a tender so that so many other companies can come in. So the assignment went to another company called Oilcom. Now because Swissport, I mean, sorry, not Swissport, uh, because the the Puma, Puma company, which had put the reservoir across the country, um, has the facility, and Oilcom does not have the facility. Therefore, there was um, 
a conflict now. How do you transfer this role from the, the previous company to the new company? While the previous company had put all the investment, all the rev reservoir according, uh, across the country. I just want to learn from your experience if you had in a situation where you have put a lot of in investment in a place where you operate and then you are told to leave. How would, was the transfer process look like? Thank you. The, normally when you, when you do an investment, particularly a sizable investment, you would have a certain duration of your contract, let's say 10, 15, or in the concession for, for airports, even 20 to 30 years. So the, all the initial plan, particularly the business plan, the uh, return on investment, and the um, amortization and depreciation are based on that. So should that, for whichever reason, change of government in this, in your example, uh, occur, then obviously the parties need to put their heads together. And there would be, um, there would be an asset value that can be easily calculated and uh, that in the end then is a compensation for breach of contract uh, if a company says, okay, this is it, and there is no quality uh, level that has been missed. Uh, so assuming that the, the quality of the product was there, then the party that decides uh, to oust the, the provider, um, the provider would be um, eligible for compensation and for a, a value that, that covers the assets. And we would make a strict case on that. Hello, uh, thank you for the presentation. My question goes to Mo Asmawi. Uh, regarding the ORAT uh, process that you were explaining that I think is very important for a successful transition of any development project, where would you suggest this ORAT team to be built in the airport entity, in the construction company, with a consultancy firm, who should own the ORAT uh, team implementation? Thank you. You mentioned who will pay for the ORAT team? Who will pay and who would be the people that compose this ORAT team? Okay, I will start with the second part. The ORAT team, there is a special contra uh, consultant in the market delivering ORAT special uh, service for aviation specifically. Become one of them, and there is in the market there is a few uh, big names are for the market now for long years are delivering ORAT service. But who will be the ORAT team? I believe it is uh, the SPV itself. It is it will be part of your uh, uh, expenses during the SB fees because at the end. Uh, the ORAT team is responsible for giving you the st to allow you to start generate revenue. So it is uh, it is the interest of all the partnership that ORAT team are in board to make sure that they start getting benefits, realizing benefit of their uh, assets. So I believe it's part. It, it, it is it could be shared. I, I cannot answer. I don't have a specific answer for this, but it could be shared uh, fees between all the partnership. Thank you.